And here we see our first image of some of the beautiful Sansai ware from the Tong dynasty. Uh, I want to start out by saying that I am not an expert in Chinese pottery. I am someone who has learned to appreciate the beauty um, partially through the study group at the San Diego Museum of Art, which devotes itself to studying Asian art each year. So that's how this presentation began. Let's start. The Tang Dynasty was a really exciting time. <clears throat> Not only did the territory expand to include the unification of South and North China, but also during this time that continued emphasis on the Confucian social order, including government-run kilns and a, a well-governed the state. The economic, <clears throat> excuse me, the economic climate favored production and commerce, and those elements helped to speed ceramic development. It was a time of prosperity for most and great wealth for government officials, noblemen, the Buddhist community, and merchants. Xi'an was the capital of the empire, and at that time in the eighth century, it was one of the lar world's largest cities. It had a population between one and three million, depending sort of like San Diego, if we, if we put the boundaries on just the city or the county. So in Xi'an, it was the very same, one and three million people. It's amazing to think of all those people from different parts of the world coming together and sharing their culture and their traditions. Art and literature flourished during this time, and it showed that influence of all the different cultures. It was also the golden age of poetry. And I love how we see the intersection of poetry and pottery coming together in this beautiful vase from the Shangsha kilns. During this time, we know about the Silk Road road routes and we can see here Shanghai, Shang, T, excuse me, Xi'an, um, right here centrally placed on this main route. But for ceramics, because they're both heavy and fragile, the C routes were preferred. And we can see this main route going all the way to connect the cultures of many different civilizations at this time. We will see that cross fertilization and that sort of conversation going back and forth between different cultures. So we know that in China, uh, tradition is valued. And of course it continues to be valued in the Tang Dynasty, but what's new? What makes this such a golden age of pottery? Well, number one is the business model. During this time, of great prosperity, we see mass production and large scale exports. We also see some technical advances, including underglazed painting, meaning uh, a potter is going to paint his design or decoration before the uh, object is fired and then put a transparent glaze over that to preserve the beautiful work that he's done. We also see the development of high-fired celadon and the creation of the first porcelains. There's a great deal of experimentation with glazes during the Tang Dynasty. The thing that we hear the most about is the Sansai glaze. Sansai is Chinese, two Chinese words, san meaning three, sai meaning color. So we have the first time when people are using three different colors, combining them in really interesting ways to glaze the objects that they're making. We also see the cobalt blue uh, glaze, very expensive and used sparingly, but it's very beautiful. During this time, unlike the pre preceding Han Dynasty, there's a preference for thin glazes, not the thick glazes we were used to seeing. And these thin glazes enable the potters 
to do many exciting things. They have new ways to apply the glaze. We see dripping, we see splashing, we see very exciting and exuberant uh, manifestations. Now, we've, uh, let's talk a little bit about the foreign influence. Much pottery is made for trade, and so it's going to cater to foreign tastes. The Chinese were also intrigued by what seemed exotic, and those in the city lived in a multicultural world. So where do we see that foreign influence? Well, one thing we see is subject matter. We see camels, we see people from foreign cultures, we see polo players. Polo is a wonderfully exciting game um, that uses horses, and it came from Persia. The Chinese were quite taken with polo, and both the men and the women enjoyed it. We also see new forms that show influence from India, from Persia, from Greece, from West Asia. The influence is definitely there, but the work is vital and original and essentially Chinese. There's a continuing conversation, especially with Persia regarding decoration. And now that we've set the stage, we're ready for our first treasure from the Tang Dynasty. This is one of my favorite works. I would love to own this one. Uh, we see a foreign woman, Turkic by her costume and her facial features on a camel, not native to China. And this artist has preserved an instant. The woman's concerned, look at her expression and pose. She's already multitasking, notice nursing her child. Uh, and she doesn't have time for this camel who's refusing her orders. The camel's angry. He's reared his head. Look at those startled eyes. His mouth is screaming, we can almost hear, and his neck is straining. All of us who are used to multitasking can identify with the feeling the artist has expressed here. In the original sculpture, there was a cord that was going from her hand to the camel's nose. And we can sense she's trying to raise that camel up and say, get on, we don't have time to linger. You can see the paint on her blanket that's covering, uh, that's underneath her salad, saddle. And under the blanket is the frame of the yurt that she and her child will put together to sleep at the end of this day. Between that yurt frame and the camel, look very closely and you can see the rolls of felt that are going to cover the yurt to keep them cozy in the evening. So let's think for a moment about how this and other works of pottery came to be. A potter begins with the clay that is native to the area he's working in. He works the clay into the shape he desires and fires it at a high temperature to preserve that shape. He may decorate it before it's fired. This piece says unfired coloring, which means that he painted it after the figure was fired. Each kiln site does things slightly differently because each of them has a slightly different form of clay to work with. Let's look now at the major kiln sites that were operating during the Tang Dynasty. We're gonna focus on three of these kiln sites, starting here with the Changsha kilns in Southern China. Um, these kilns produced lots of things for export, lots of things for Chinese ordinary people as well, and most of it was everyday objects and stoneware. These are the people that produced, or that discovered, excuse me, invented uh, underglazed painting. Because they were producing so much, and when we talk about a kiln site, um, I want to let you know that there were over 200 kilns operating in this area. Uh, and this is the area where they're really doing a lot of innovation because they're making so many wares and so much is for export. Also in the South, 
we're going to talk about the UA kilns. These are the kilns in which celadon was produced. Celadon is fired at a slightly higher temperature. Lastly, we're going to focus on the northern kilns up here, the Ding and Xing uh, kilns, where they were working and developing the first porcelain. Most of these kilns produced more than one quality of ware. So certainly the porcelain and the celadon were more expensive and were created for um, a little bit for expert, but mostly for the royal families and the wealthy people of China. We're gonna begin here with the Changsha kilns. The clay, remember that's our very first element, was a light beige. They're known for their stoneware, which is between 1100 and 1300 degrees Celsius. Their um, glazes were lead flux and they also were known for some of their sansai glazes. We'll see some of the things that uh, were a combination of sansai glaze and underglaze painting. Very lovely. The shapes from these kilns are often rounder and stockier than those from the UA kilns. It's a manufacturing hub. Here they favored freedom and self-expression. Uh, by favoring this kind of freedom, we see they leave room for lots of development and lots of interesting new things that are happening. A lot of different kinds of directions. We see underglazed painting. We see them applying ornaments and dipping and splashing. Let's look. Here are some of the popular traditional forms uh, that were created in the Changsha kilns. We see some new forms also. During the Tang Dynasty, this spittoon shape was first introduced, as was the lobed bowl and the gourd shape. We also see that they liked very rounded objects. And here, notice how high on the body the handles are placed. Although the decoration doesn't look wild and vivid here, if we look closely, we can see how important it is. Did you notice the small amount of cobalt blue around the neck here of the, this vessel? Artists are starting to experiment. Look at this calligraphy-like design on the spittoon. So it's a, an area where these are made for everyday people, and yet we see wonderful innovation. One reason we know so much about, oh, let's go ahead, I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself. Um, let's look here because this is a wonderful example of that kind of highly decorated work that came from this kiln. One of the innovations is this hexagonal spout, handles high on the body, and then look right here where our eye is drawn. In order to make this kind of decoration, they would first use a mold to create this, add it to the wet clay body, and then over the entire vessel, they would do a clear glaze. After that clear glaze was applied, the Changsha um, kilns often did this dipping. So you see, you can imagine, just dipping in on this side, on the next side, on the next side. It adds a spontaneous kind of beauty that we hadn't seen earlier. Now, one reason we know so much about this kiln is because of a shipwreck. Uh, this, is, this ship was discovered in 1998 off the coast of Belatong in Indonesia. It's not a Chinese ship, but an Arab Dao, a merchant ship that had come to pick up a load of goods from China to deliver to the Middle East. The cargo included wares from five different kiln sites that had been packed in Canton in large storage jars. Luckily for us, one bowl actually had a date inscribed on it, eight 26. 
Now, the numbers of different kinds of wares in this ship really tell a story about the export business of ceramics. Although there were 53,000 ceramics on this ship, only 119 were the fine porcelain, the Jing wares. 218 were the Yue wares, that Celadon that we'll be talking about. And all the rest were from the Shangsha uh, kiln sites. So let's take a peek at some of the goods that were discovered on this ship. An amazing number of bowls and everyday wear. You can see the use of the Sansai or three color decoration. We have the cream, the green, and the brown. I hope you noticed that that brown was dipped. It was dipped uh, much the same as we saw in the previous ewer. Uh, and this way it makes a kind of frame for the inside decoration. The characteristics of these particular uh, bowls are that wonderful uh, spontaneity and the extreme formal simplicity. And there's a concern for the expression, expressive potential of paint. So we can imagine the artists, artisans sitting and painting their designs, again, under glazed painting, painting the designs before it is glazed. And each one you could see is unique. So they would paint something from nature, uh, something that just came to them. And in one instance, some almost Arabic calligraphy, calligraphy. It lets us know that the potters who were making this are well aware of the intended audience. This is not for Chinese, this is for the Middle East and they're going to do what they can to make it appeal to them. And in fact, this uh, form of bowls was not very popular in China at the time. It was intended for the Middle Eastern audiences. So let's look now <clears throat> at the UAE region um, and what they produced and their kilns. The clay here is slightly different. It's a kaolin-based clay and it was used for stoneware and what we call proto-porcelain. It's a type of early stoneware, closely resembles true porcelain, but it usually lacks that translucent quality. The clay from this area is light gray or beige and was fired at a slightly higher temperature, 1240 to 1300. The glaze is usually a grayish green, olive green, or putty colored. It's what we call celadon. The Yue wire was considered a luxury I <clears throat> excuse me, item, and it was made for the royal family, for the wealthy Chinese, as well as some export. Remember, there's 218 pieces on this one shipwreck. They made mostly traditional things, tea bowls, vases, boxes, and ewers. The decoration on Celadon was always minimal because color is the focus. Here we see two examples. One looks very much like stoneware. It has a more substantial look about it. The other looks very much like porcelain. We see that lobbed bowl shape again, and the bee disc foot that is also uh, seen in a lot of the Tang Dynasty ceramics. Notice the beauty of that celadon glaze. It is so close to things that we would see in nature that it was highly, highly prized in China as well as abroad. Let's look at another example of Yue ware. Here we see something with a very subtle decoration. We see molded leaves on the outside attached and inside when we look closely we can see an incised pattern. This celadon ware would have been prized 
both in Persia and in China. Here we see something from our own San Diego Museum of Art, a scholar's water bowl with the beautiful celadon glaze. Again, the decoration is very minimal because the color of the celadon is what's important and what's beautiful. Lastly, I want to share with you this tea bowl. Some thought that celadon was the best color for drinking tea because of the way the tea looked in the bowl. You can imagine holding this in your hand with a nice cup of steaming tea and enjoying both the look, the smell, and the flavor of that tea. So we've looked at some pieces from the Changsha Kiln and some from the Yue Kiln. Our last look by Kiln will be the white wares from the Northern kiln, Kilns, the Xing and the Ding Kilns. Some connoisseurs consider these superior to the Yue ware because of the silvery sheen and the whiteness. Poets, including Lu Yu, sometimes compared the Xing ware to silver in poems. Here, like the Yue Kilns, they have kale and clay, but they add feldspar and that they fire it at a slightly higher temperature and that permits porcelain to be developed. The whiteware was also very popular in both Egypt and Indonesia. Number 119, so the fewest pieces in the shipwreck because we're going up in cost. Stoneware is the most affordable, then the UA ware, and finally, things from the Xing and Ding kilns. Let your eyes drink in the beauty of these wares. Imagine how this would feel in your hand. In the West, the term porcelain is reserved for ceramics that are white, translucent and resonant and are fired at temperatures above 1300 degrees Celsius while stoneware can lack some of these characteristics. In practice, there's no distinct dividing line between the two, but a continuum. This new form has that translucence that we associate with porcelain. I think if I was holding this, it would feel cold. It has that silvery shine that the poets speak about. This example of dingware features the bright white finish so many admire. Many bowls with this form have been found in the area we now call Iraq. This was widely exported. Because many of you may think, like I did, that blue and white ware began in the 14th century, I want to share this example with you. These three intact pieces were found in that same shipwreck. They are also from a northern uh, kiln. We can see that probably a white slip was applied before the underglaze painting of this palmette design from, that originated from Egypt and was very popular in Greece and the Middle East. So our very first blue and white ware very early in the production, and certainly not the quality that we're going to see later in the Ming Dynasty. Perhaps the very best known pottery from the Tang Dynasty would be those wonderful tomb figures. The Sansai glaze was very popular for tomb wear, and tomb, fi tomb figures were part of the burial uh, ritual. Here we see an example. They are noted to be very naturalistic. We can almost feel the personality of this horse and rider. Usually they were created by using molds and when there would be a front mold and a back mold and the two halves would be fired and then attached together with some slip and glazed. Here we see the three colors. We see blue, cream, and the brown. 
the figures that were included in the tombs were meant to provide safe and an enjoyable environment in the afterlife. Imagine you're waking to an afterlife with this figure. You have a wonderful companion and she's brought a horse to help you go where you need to go. It's a delightful piece and it's certainly a treasure um, for the person who was buried and for the relatives who's, who have chosen to give it to them. Now, we have three kinds of figures, tomb figures. We're gonna see male figures, we'll see female figures and animals. The male figures were very realistic with active pole poses. They were used mostly to drive away evil spirits, but they could also be civil servants or grooms or polo players, somebody to help you um, while away those leisure hours and have a good time in the afterlife. Let's look. Look at how muscular and frightening this would be if an evil spirit tried to approach a tomb. You'll notice that his face is not painted. Typically the faces were not glazed, but they were painted after the firing. And so the paint has worn off this figure um, where the glazes of course will last for a very long time. We can also notice the exuberance of that Sansai paint that has been dripped on. Do you see how it's dripping down? That abstract look is a wonderful contrast with the realistic uh, depiction of this person who is standing here guarding your tomb. Here is another guardian and look at what happened to the demon who tried to approach. Here we see somebody, a civil servant perhaps, who's going to help us and a polo player because we need to have some entertainment just as we do in this life. Let's look at our female figures. They are very uh, soft with leisurely movements. Their job is to entertain, to serve, and to make enemies jealous. We'll see maids and entertainers. We also have a very good focus on styles and fashions. So before the eighth century, the female figures were quite slender. Over time, a little roundness was introduced and was thought to be more attractive. We'll see a change in both fashion uh, and hairstyles and their faces too are usually unglazed. Here we have an early slender figure looking in the mirror, trying to look her best for us. Notice how the glaze has been applied here. Less dripping and yet there's still the blending of the colors that is so uh, exciting in this Sansai period. Here we see a woman a little later, a little rounder, sitting leisurely with her dog and here as a companion uh, for us in this afterlife. Another woman on horseback. She and her horse look to be one unit here. And look at the texture on her blanket. It is so, so detailed. From our San Diego Museum of Art, here is a dancer who is going to entertain us. Look, notice her shoes and the way that she wears her hair. We can identify the time in which she was created by those details. Let's look at some of the animals who were buried in tombs. Horses are the most popular. Um, horses you can use to, for transportation. If you need to fight a war, a horse is your best friend. Or if you want to play polo, lots of uses for horses in this next life. Camels were also popular, especially for those who had commercial interests. Also included in some tombs are oxen and farm animals and sometimes lions who were often symbols of Buddhism. So let's look at a few examples. This is maybe the, my favorite horse that I've ever seen. Uh, he is so active, again, like our very first example. The artist has captured a moment in time. You can imagine the speed in which this horse would move. 
and here you are, there's room for you on the saddle. So if you're waking up into the afterlife and you have this horse by your side, you are a very lucky person indeed. This charming ox we know will work hard for us. Look at the glaze, a single color just dripping. Remember that we're preferring these thin glazes and this wonderful lion who is here to remind us of some tenets of Buddhism at the same time that he can help protect us. And again, from our San Diego Museum, a wonderful camel. This camel is, is pretty large. It's about four feet tall. And we see uh, that same expression, very expressive works, realistically done uh, creations of these animals. And yet we have the dripping glazes to add a little spontaneity. Here between our humps, we see the face of a foreigner. We know that this camel is going to take us along that silk road where we can trade goods, we can trade ideas. So we've been looking at wares <clears throat> from different kilns and we noticed some differences from pottery in of earlier er eras. Perhaps the most striking changes in pottery took form in, de in decoration. Let's talk about the glazes that people are going to use. First of all, we see a variety of color and combinations of color that we have not seen before. Remember our sansai, the three colors are used extensively, not just for burial wear, but that's what we usually associate them with because when you bury the ceramics, they're going to be preserved. And so we've seen lots and lots of them from um, the excavation of tombs, sometimes not on purpose. 1928 was the time when this word sansai was first introduced. And it was the time when railroads were being built and digging was being done and tombs were discovered. Cobalt blue was introduced during this time too. Um, it was very expensive. And so we don't see a lot of examples of it. When we do see it, we know that it was a finely um, made piece of pottery. And so in order to honor the craftsmanship of that pottery, sometimes a very expensive glaze would be used. During the time of the Tang Dynasty, clay was often coated with a white slip before glazing because that helped to brighten the colors. Uh, the, we see drips uh, because the potter would say, I'm going to entrust the finish to nature. We know that that force of nature is going to bring the drips down. and We don't know exactly how it's going to look. It's going to be a bit of a surprise and usually a delightful mixing of colors. The artisans would dip and they would drip and they would splash colors to create this exuberance, this spontaneity um, that would be a contrast with the very traditional forms. Sometimes they would incise patterns to stop the colors from running into each other. And certainly underglazed painting was a huge uh, technical advance that would allow these colors to remain vibrant until today. Let's look now at some of these beautiful glazes that are coming to us from the Tong Dynasty. The monochrome lead glazes are absolutely gorgeous. And I'm going to share some of them with you today because I want you to have this wonderful experience of beauty early on this Saturday morning. Look at this vibrant green. It's almost like a watercolor. Do you notice how the value shifts from this very dark to the very light? And then it's mixing and blending. And I love the way it drips at the bottom. Right here, it gets clear to the foot, which is often not allowed because when glaze gets onto the foot, it can cause an issue when you uh, need to take it off the kiln. Sometimes it will stick. The beauty of the form is really enhanced by this monochrome 
glazed. Let's look at a different shade of green. Again, we see that wonderful blending of different shades or values of green as the glaze makes its way down the vessel. And look at this wonderful line it's creating. When you dip it into upside down into the glaze and you pull it out again, you don't know exactly how it's going to look. You don't know where it's going to stop. And part of that is the delight of this decoration. Yet another shade of green. We can imagine how this bowl was dipped and then righted. The elegance and the simplicity is, leaves, is what we admire about this kind of decoration. Look here at this line that has been created by that blending and that settling of the glaze. This melon-shaped vase is covered head to toe, inside and outside. Uh, it's our Stelladon, again, that we love. And notice the wonderful incising here and the tilt of this lip of the vessel. It does give us the sense that this is a gourd and yet much, much more. Here we have a very elegant black glaze. This one was allowed to cool very slowly because the person who was making it did not want this to crack. Sometimes in some wares we see crackling that was intended because it adds to the appearance. But in this particular case, this beautiful smooth exterior adds to our appreciation of this vessel. Cobalt blue. This was indeed a new discovery during this time. We see that same watercolor-like effect on the body of this vessel. In China, the use of this finely ground cobalt as a colorant uh, emulated the vibrant blue glass from the Middle East. The Chinese potters applied this gla glaze to off-white earthenware and low-fired stoneware and the source has been uh, contested. Originally, we assumed that the cobalt blue had come from Persia. However, recently there has been some chemical analysis of the Tong blue glazes, and they seem to be chemically distinct from Middle Eastern ceramics and suggest that perhaps there was a Chinese source for this colorant, regardless of where it came from. Uh, it is something that is a shared tradition between China now and Persia. Well, I hope that you've enjoyed looking at these lush single wares. We're now gonna look at some Sansai glazing and I want you to see which ones you prefer. The Sansai glaze used primarily for tomb ware, most popular in the middle part of the Tang Dynasty and the colors appear from the interaction of the metallic elements <clears throat> that have been added to the glaze. If an artist needed to control um, the color, and sometimes they wanted to, they could use a wax or a clay flower paste to cover areas during the glazing po uh, process. The unpredictability of the result is an exciting contrast with the detailed naturalism of the tomb animals and the figures. Here's another camel from the San Diego Museum of Arts collection. And this one really highlights the glaze. The camel himself is a, a very beautiful animal, but look at how the drips are accentuating different areas. And you can imagine that when the artisan is, is applying this, that mystery of how it's going to end up how these colors, this green and brown, are going to mix together. And you don't know until you take it out of the kiln. Very exciting. Well, let's look at different ways that these three colors can be applied. Here we have it splashed on, meaning that the artist is probably using a sponge-like um, uh, instrument to apply the glaze. And you can see that first there was a transparent uh, colorless glaze, and then 
he added these colors and look at how they're dripping. Look at these beautiful patterns that come because the artist is willing to let nature help him in his decoration. Excuse me, Betty, there are five minutes remaining. Oh, bless you, thank you so much. Uh, here we have a splashed glaze, again, applied with a sponge, not so much dripping, but we see the blending once again of colors. Sometimes artists wanted a more exacting way for the colors to look and they painted it on. Here we see a very charming duck who is carefully carved. And then when the artist painted it, he was free to paint outside the lines. I love looking at the feathers and we can see each feather carved carefully. And yet the artist chose not to paint within the lines. Here, an artist is painting pre free form using four colors uh, on this vessel. And here, very neatly contained within grooved outlines. This was not a vessel where the artist wanted a blending of colors. Each color is distinct and each color stays in its place. He is coloring within the lines. Both are beautiful um, and it would be hard to choose a favorite. Uh, all right, let's uh, end our time together by enjoying a visual feast. A visual feast of the many successful experiments of decoration in the Tong Dynasty. Let your eyes roam the surfaces of these works and see which you prefer. prefer. The green splash wares were especially popular in Persia. This is a Persian form that had been, uh, the vessel had been popular in a metal form. The potters took it in China and made it their own and then did this splashed green decoration, which was very popular. The blue splashed over the brown is quite dramatic and it becomes more popular later on in China. Here we see an example of underglazed painting from the Changsha kiln, where they're using the cobalt blue to paint a very free form design. And here another example from the Changsha kilns, underglazed painting, a lobed bowl, and something from nature. Here we have an underglazed, molded, and applied directions decoration. So look here at this quatrefoil design in the little zipper and up here. These extra bits of clay decoration would have been applied before the vessel was glazed and then adhered with the glaze. Very simple and elegant. The vessel form comes from Persia. And we're gonna see a couple examples of mold impress. And I wanted to show you what that means. So uh, a potter would make a mold of a design that he wanted to use in several hundreds, maybe thousands of, of uh, bowls, say. And here's the bowl. So you make your bowl and you take this example and you press it there and there's your design to be painted. Very quick. Remember, this is a manufacturing era. Here's an example of how this looks once it's done. This is, is, has been mold and pressed and then underglazed painted. Stunning example and I'm sure would have been very costly then and certainly now. Um, this one is in the Chicago Institute. Here we have something, another example of an interesting decoration. So first of all, the quatrefoil design was stamped into this wrist rest and then black clay was embedded in the outline and then it was glazed. So step after step after step, a very precious instrument for a scholar. 
a beautiful example of the UA wear um, with a subtly incised decoration. And here, more UA wear, underglazed, carved. Remember that the UA wear rarely has added decoration because the celadon itself is so beautiful. The last examples I'm going to share with you today are examples of marbled earthenware. This was a technique in which a potter would take two different shades of clay and work them out together so that he ended up with molded clay to make his ware. So this is a beautiful example of a molded vessel that was then glazed with an amber glaze. And one more with a clear glaze. You can really see the example here. And then to add contrast, just a single color foot here. Now, as you might imagine, mixing those clays is a lot of work. And so some artists let it happen in the slip. It's much easier to get that marbled effect in a liquid. Well, we have seen some wonderful, beautiful examples of Tang Dynasty pottery today. I hope you've enjoyed looking at them and we'll spend some time looking online at different museums who have these in their collection. The Tang Dynasty is famous for its energetically modeled and brightly colored tomb figures made from low fired earthenware <clears throat> and intended exclusively for burial. These charming figures were immensely popular. In their own day, however, they were neither at the forefront of ceramic technology nor highly regarded by collectors or connoisseurs. It was in the making of functional ceramics for daily use and export that Tong Piter, potters achieved their greatest technical innovations and refinements. They invented porcelain, underglaze painting, perfected high-fired celadon, and experimented with the cobalt blue glazes. Their interest in these single color wares lays the ground, groundwork for the future. I hope that um, this is something that will stick in your heart, uh, the beauty of these wonderful creations. Thanks so much for your attention. Thank you so much, Betty, for that enlightening presentation. That was wonderful. Um, I know that there were some key themes that came out of this presentation that you may have questions about or would like to discuss, but we ask that you perhaps write down those questions and raise your hand digitally so that we can address them after our next presenter. Um, thank you again, Betty, for that lovely presentation. And now we're going to move over to um, Andy Liu, our commentator for today. Now, Andy has previously presented at our lecture series in the past due to his keen interest and knowledge of Chinese history and culture. He's an avid collector of Chinese antiques and artifacts. And we do have the pleasure today to hear from him and his insights and see some of the samples within his own personal collection. Andy? Thank you, Evan. Uh, thank you, Evelyn. And uh, today, it's my pleasure to talk about the Tang Dynasty. Tang is a dynamic dynasty in the Chinese history. And uh, there are only, there are, there are so many, you know, foreigner influence in this dynasty. And as you can see, you got the, you know, the Buddhism, is coming from Tang Dynasty. Uh, they're so fast uh, influence in Chinese because I think in my own opinion, because uh, they're very close to Chinese Confucius. They got a lot of ideas very close. That's why they are so, so popular and it's become the number one religions in China. And also in influence to the Korea, Japan, and the South into the Vietnam 
Myanmar and through Thailand. And also, they have the only women emperor in Chinese history. And compared today, you know, the, you know, we have the vice president, Harris, you know, is the vice president. And in that time in China, they, they already break the tradition. You have a lady emperor. Okay, go next. And in that time, the Tang Dynasty is like the cultural center for the war because he absorbed so many, you know, the foreign influence, especially we can see from the Sun Chai. Uh, you know, we can see the, you know, the polo player and uh, we see the Lali, you know, the uh, musicians and the figurines. All the Persians uh, look like the Persian or they look like the, you know, the East Europeans. Then go next. Okay, this one is the only one we find uh, is the musician on the camel's back. And you can see they played all the instrument is from the Europe or from the Persian. And the middleman is a dancer. He dances called the Wu Ren Wu. You know, it's uh, very popular in the, today the, uh, in the Persian, so it's very popular, this dancing. So in that time, you know, the, today's there, you know, in the Xinjiang, we talk about, you know, the uh, Weaver, you know, they are very popular dance. They're still dancing in the dancing. It's very fast and the turn around, you know, it's really, really nice. Uh, okay, let's go next. Okay, this is my collections. And there's a, there's a, there's a lady play the polo. Okay, the polo, this, uh, this game is coming from, you know, the either the Iran or the East European, something like that. You know, it's through the Silk Road, then coming to the Tang Dynasty. As you know, the Tang Dynasty, they love the horse. And, uh, you know, the first emperor for the Tang Dynasty, front of his tomb, he have uh, six horses that go with him, you know, the conquered, uh, uh, conquered for become the big China, you know, he, he fight with all, you know, the other tribe or the foreign country, something like that. So front of, front of his tomb, he's got uh, six horses. And two of them is in the University of Pennsylvania's museum. So if you go there, see it, you can see four of them right now. Okay, go next. This is the polo player in the Guild Museum in Paris, France. And you can see, you know, all put them together, they really like they play the polo, you know. Okay, go next. Okay, this is uh Sun Chai horse, pulling a carriage. And uh, unfortunately, that his one leg is broken. I think it's because, you know, by the way, the Sun Chai, 80%, 90% is coming from the tomb for the underground. So most of them are all damaged. So this way, uh, this one look at the horse's jump, you know, maybe he sees something, you know. And you can see the two, servants stand on each side and they put the carriage in that time they got a two pipe this is a close one the people usually can sit inside other ones are open usually that one's for the warrior for the soldier you know stand on and let's go to the next okay this one is a two dragon base this is a imitate the persians civil well in the Persian Civil War, I have a lot of these types of uh, base for the wine or something like that. You know, you, then you can see, you know, that they have a lot of foreign influence 
in Tang Dynasty. And uh, this kind of color have a, this is called a white color and they also have a green and then they also have a sunshine. Okay. Also, this one is previously owned by the Chen Xiangmei Anna Chen. And uh, her husband is uh, General Shinot. They are the founder of the Fly Tiger. The history is this. They are very, very popular and are respected by the Chinese people. In the Second World War, and uh, when China fight with the Japanese, and China don't have any airplane. In that time, so the General Chinut, he organized a volunteer, uh, uh, like you know, Air Force, to join the Chinese fight the Japanese. So today we still have a Fight Tiger Museum in China. And also you go to Yunnan, you can see they have a airport, a small airport, you know, in that time for the Fight Tigers, you know, the airplane, the park there, you know. And they really, really, really helped China in the Second World War. I think, you know, the go back 10, 20 years ago, they have a lot of retired uh, Fight Tigers member visit China. They make a big things in that time. Okay, let's go next. Okay, this is the Kangxi Times, uh, Sanchai. Because you know, in the Sanchai, so influenced to the, later on the culture, you know, even to the Qing Dynasty. So I just bring up uh, this one to show you. And also I want to mention one thing. In Tang Dynasty, the Sanchai, very unique only happened in the Tang Dynasty. The reason the later time they find is this, because the sun time, the gloss, they used so many lead in there. So the craftsmen or artists working in the kiln, all of them is die young. It's around the 30 or 40 something. Then they find out that because the lead is very poison. So you only can see this in the happy in the town. You won't happen to see the later time like a song or yuan or ming. You, there's no more in this sunset because they realize this is a very poisoning. Okay, let's go next. Okay, this is the you know, Tang Dynasty, so popular for the Buddhism, especially. I just mentioned the female emperor, Wu Zetian. He's really, really pushed this uh, religion in, the, in China. So this Buddha is a building there. This is the highest, the tallest Buddha in the world. This set on the Mingjiang in the Sichuan. You know, you can take the river, you can, uh, can see it far away. And also you can climb there. You have a letter, you can go to the eye, can go to see the ear, something like that. It's very big, huge. And uh, you can see because of the, you know, the Buddhism is so popular because just like I mentioned before, and Confucius is very, very close to Buddhism. You got a lot of idea in there, you know. They are very inclusive and they, they try the, the people do not uh, revenge, try to not revenge your enemies or something like that, you know, so it's very popular. Okay, let's go next. Okay, this is the Wu Zetian. Recently, Paul, they pick up uh, 10 best uh, emperor in China. The number one, of course, is the Tang Dynasty. The first emperor in Tang Dynasty. The second is the uh, first emperor in the Han Dynasty. Number three is the Qing Zi Huang. Uh, we know, you know, the, he got uh, almost 7,000 soldiers protect his tomb. You know, he's number three. And number five, I shall mention, is uh, Chinggis Han, the Yuan Dynasty. And uh, Wu Zetian, 
is a number number nine. And uh, he's a very polite and uh, very humble uh, emperor. You know, usually when they die, they have a tombstone in front of the, their, 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 their grave. I visited there, you know, the other suburb of the Xi'an. Her is a blank. You don't have any words on it because he say, I don't want a judgment by myself. See how great I am. I want the later people, they give me a judgment, me. Judgment, give me a judgment. See how good I am. He's a real good. That's why they voted him a number nine. Okay, okay, this is my last one. And uh, thank you everybody to enjoy with me and share my collections. Thank you very much, Evelyn.